the easiest parts of the inflation going down have already, we, we were capturing those now, like, right, uh, releasing the SPR to decrease gasoline prices. That was certainly a, a big decrease in, in July's number. And then, you know, I can, I can tell you, Eric, like just from firsthand, like um, I can tell that supply chains are easing up, like container costs have gone way down, haven't had any delays. Are we recording? Because I did, I did just log in there and see that ETH was pamping again. And um, you know what? You know, I think this is, I think we're totally range bound here. And um, the fact that I sold puts this morning and ETH is up, you know, another 6% since I sold those puts feels very good. Sounds like um, you should close those puts but, out right now. I, yeah, I might. I, you know, I might. I might. I might just close down our podcast and go back <laughs> to trade ordering. So what are we uh what are we talking today? We we might have potentially uh the largest week in crypto. We got a lot of things happening in the upcoming week. Yes. We got a merge yes. coming. We have a CPI print potentially on the same day, if not the day before. We're having the merge of crypto and macro. We have uh Sorry, Eric, excuse Eric, me guys. What what's the merge? It's very meta. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, uh Eric's wedding uh, night. When you get to merge for the very oh first time and consummate God, it's the, the wedding, triple merge. Holy yeah, crap. it's gonna be a double merge. <laughs> it's gonna be a merge of uh, man and woman. It's gonna be a it's gonna be a, a rug doctor in the background. <laughs> you're gonna pull behind. Me. <laughs> you're gonna uh, you're gonna have uh, you're gonna be a day after the merge. I don't know how Hoffman's gonna make it to your wedding. I'd say thirty percent chance he makes it. The crazy thing is like. Um, the, like the merge date is uncertain, right? Like the time and date's uncertain. So he's going to host a merge party. Like when is that? Like when's he going to host the party? Like the merge could happen at like three in the morning. Yeah. Eastern Just time on, on standby. Wednesday. Party. Like who's going to come to that? Party mode on standby. Um. Okay. Let's get into it. Should we do a little alpha alpha round first? Yeah. Okay. Why don't yeah. you guys go ahead? I heard we do that. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll start. Um. I uh, closed out some shorter expiration puts. Thank God I did them before. So recording today's a Wednesday. Is it the seventh? Yeah, September seventh. So uh, closed them out yesterday. Market pumped today. So Damn, glad I uh, got lucky, basically, <laughs> and uh, closed out some shorter expiration <laughs> well, ones. Oh, no, you're a great trader. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Um, I do wish I kind of would have used like uh, an, like shorted an RK instead of uh, the market. I had done that before. I don't know why I didn't do it this time, but regardless, um, yeah, it's done. So anyway, that was the moves of the week. And uh, yeah, just watching, waiting for the big, big Super Bowl event. Nice. Steven, go ahead. Oh, you're going to like this one. I, I didn't want to reveal it before because I, I didn't want to like uh, blow up the cap of the uh, the, the vault. But uh, I've been using the, uh, are you familiar with Squeeth? Yeah. Yeah, I've been using the uh, Squeeth uh, crab vault. The we are definitely that? crabbing. Yeah. So squeeze crab vault probably I mean, is doing well, pretty well. The crab vault is up like 5% since July and we have not been crabbing. So what eats like range down between for, for, for those of you out there who don't know what the hell squeeze is, squeeze squee is a uh, sort of options derivative. It's sort of like a perpetual ETH squared, you know, options fueled, weird derivative that goes up massive when ETH goes up and goes down massive when ETH goes down, but you can't get liquidated. So it's kind of fun. But when you were on the long end of that, you were paying, I think I checked today and the funding was like 120% uh, wow. annualized. So yeah, so the, the, the crab vault is sort of automating a delta neutral strategy. Um, but it sounds expensive. But, um, it, it, I don't know if Delta Neutral is the right word, but it's it's a hedge strategy. Well, you are effectively collecting that funding if you are writing the crab, you know, which is what you're doing. So, um, like, how tight does that band have to be to be considered crab? So today, I, so today, I for example, like just totally today, for down. example, um, it, they they redo the hedge like every two days. So as long as the price doesn't move like eight point five percent in the hedge period, the the vault is profitable. It's a pretty big move. Yeah, so it's a big move. You you don't find that too often, but but when you, you do have a pretty big catalyst uh, coming up here, that's probably why the funding's so high, right? Mm, yes, although it has been close to this high for a while. I think just due to the nature of uh, how it works. Right. But yeah, I do think people are also piling in on the the the, the YOLO leverage right now because we got a we got a thing coming up next week. Wait, are you doing this in the small account or the big account? 
What do you mean the small account or the big account? I don't know. Are you using a lot of money in this thing? No, no. I don't like to dump uh, massive amounts of my uh, bankroll into untested smart contract vaults <laughs> as a general rule. Um, and uh, is the squeeze is through Dopex? Is that right? No, it's through op- Opine. Open. Opine. O-P-Y-N. Opi- Opine, I think it is. Open. I think it's Open. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think, okay. I think that's who runs it. Don't, don't quote me on that, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that's yeah. where, it, where it comes from. Um, that's but a cool yeah, strat. Cool, I want to look cool into strat. I think they're launching a bull cool. and a bear one, particularly like as well. they, they have a long vault as well, right? Like, like a squeak long. No, they, they only have the crab bold. open right now, but they are opening a long and a short one. So the short one's going to be like an interesting strat if you want to just fade the market for a while, you know, for the next year or so. Um, collect a little premium. Be on your merry way. We'll talk about that in our yeah. next segment. Uh, Yep. I'm excited to talk about that in our next segment. Uh, and for that reason, my um, my alpha alpha round this week is going to be another uh, life alpha alpha. Oh, God. Um, I just your spent about the last wife month is gonna be bad with at you a if you're big trading. mustache on my face. And I want to talk about that. <laughs> oh, Eric. Yeah, you shaved the mustache off. I, I shaved my mustache. I apologize I for I not acknowledging it. I notice. I am so observant. <laughs> so I think there's like there's a couple things that I want to talk about with this. Like one... Um, I've, I've never had facial hair in my life. And what I noticed is like something that like an ex, 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 ex girlfriend told me a long time ago when I used to like not care about how I dressed or anything. And, and I thought like, well, my character will speak for itself. And, you know, like people will see like through the sweatpants or whatever. And like, she told me, she's like, she informed me that like people are going to see you for how you present yourself. And this facial hair thing is very similar to that. Like, I'm noticing that I get treated differently with the mustache than without, you know, like I have a little bit of a baby face here. And when I had the mustache going, I noticed a couple of things. Like one, if I stopped at like a four way intersection with the mustache on, like <laughs> Karen moms would defer to me. They'd be like, you go, sir. <laughs> like in Costco, like I would be walking down the aisles and, you know, people would like, let me go first. Just but without like- the mustache, you know, I'm back to being like baby. The Maybe testosterone Asian, is like oozing from you, like a, like a <laughs> sphere of testosterone around the world. So I think there was something to that. I mean, like the bottom line is I, I don't see myself with a mustache long term. I like my face. I like to be able to see it. But like I did notice that there was some alfalfa within the facial hair. And it's like people treat you differently how you present yourself. And the mustache is no different. I feel terrible that we didn't even notice. I think we were just so nervous because Armand wasn't here and we didn't want to screw this yeah, up. I don't feel terrible. <laughs> this is classic me. So you guys, uh, you guys are both invited to the uh, rehearsal dinner at my wedding. The rehearsal dinner is going to be a, a cowboy themed rehearsal dinner party. I was going to keep the mustache for that event. Yeah, I thought that, that was the but You didn't. It's like, is it not hot as balls in San Diego? It's like, it's like 95 degrees in Wyoming. Like I was just getting like sweat stuck in my mustache i just couldn't handle it anymore you gotta shave off the uh, mouth sweater for the yeah, rehearsal dinner just couldn't do it all right okay so what do we got here boys let's set the stage so we got merge coming next week we have uh cpi print on september 13th mm-hmm. i believe we have eth butting up against its 20-week moving average um in the long haul we have some midterms coming up so i think we just want to have a little chat about how we feel about this what we think the general market's going um, what are the, you know, what's the base case, bull case, bear case? Um, yeah, Stephen, why don't you start? How are you feeling about things? Yeah, I mean, look, I'm I'm still positioned long. Um, I would like to say that I, I front run Darius, who is now projecting, a, I, I saw a 30, 35% chance of Goldilocks in the fall. We talk about that a little bit more, um, which is kind of the equivalent of a soft landing, I guess. Um, so I, I got out ahead of that in July. I bought. I thought I thought I was going to round trip that whole trade the other day. All the way back down. All the way back down. I was like, <laughs> ah, this is so me. I missed my missed my two K sell my my hedge. Um, but I'm 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 kind of in it for the tech now, at least until next week. So, uh, but I think I'm I think I'm still bullish uh, short midterm. I don't know how much detail you want to go into here. Um, but generalized thesis is that I, I, I am greatly fading like extreme sentiment, which I love to do. Um, I think that we are going to get like some pretty aggressively 
downside CPI core prints coming up. Um, last I checked, the markets are pricing like 77% chance of a 75 bips hike. Uh, yeah, but do you think that matters as much as the, I think the inflation print matters more than, than what the Fed might do in the following, like two weeks after that? Like, but what the Fed is going to do is going to depend on the, infl- the right, right. like if, if core, if, if a CPI comes in year over year with like a six handle, you might get a zero or like a 25 hike, right? Like, but, but the, the, like 25 is a zero probability right now. So, and just a quick data point. I mean, we're not going to get a six, Mr. Shaking Your Head, but if we yeah. <laughs> did get a six, you might get a zero or a 25. That would be like a pretty big flashing, like, whoa, guys, uh, the economy is about to explode type yeah, so signal. Yeah, so Cleveland Fed has some inflation now casting models. So right now they put the September, or excuse me, the August CPI at uh, 8.24 headline number and that's four it's only what six days of data but um or i guess no i take that back it's six days of data after the full month so we'll see how 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 uh, accurate this now casting is but you know in in july we had this like very steep fall off in inflation it was something like i don't know 98th 99th percentile decrease in inflation yeah like it was the it was the biggest drop off since november 20th which was also a pretty big drop off and there were a couple other like subsets of the PCE that were the lowest ever recorded in terms of like a you know it was like a three month rolling average change to the downside right right? so I I mean that's a big deal The, the other thing that I think is a possibility that I haven't heard a lot of people talking about yet is that we've been hearing about how the the consumer is very very strong right and that's true like there are massive amounts of savings right now like household savings i think are still like three trillion above where they were pre-covid like so the balance sheet's pretty strong uh we keep hearing about how the labor market's strong wages are up right that type of stuff is sticky like the wages are a lot stickier than the cost of something like gasoline for example so we could get into a situation where you have like these inflationary pressures they they, they push wages up right but then if CPI drops off dramatically, those wages aren't going to go down in the fall, but the cost of all this stuff may go down. So you can get into a situation where for a few months you have consumers with like dramatic increases in like real purchasing power. Um, you could also see corporations continue to not see declines in uh, real earnings because um, the... Pricing power of corporations is still far outpacing the the wages. I think like wages have been growing at like six or seven percent. Right. But like some of the uh, PPI numbers, some of the measures of cost of goods, they're, they're up like 11, 12 percent, some of them. So, so you net those out and corporations are ahead earnings wise. Yeah. That's why like if you look at corporate margins, that like they're like kind of like the highest they've ever been. And profits are basically the highest they've ever been. So I, I see a lot of reason to be bullish juxtaposed with a really negative sentiment juxtaposed with like, I, I as far as I can tell, markets are still pretty hedged to the downside. Um, so I, I just see like a bit of asymmetry there, especially with like, with like the merge coming up because I am playing this trade like entirely via Ethereum. Um, right. You know, it's just just the best. If you want to be risk on, I feel like that's the best way to be risk on. So that 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 that's what I'm doing. What, I mean, what do you think about this thought that the the CPI when CPI is high, like over five six percent, CPI volatility is also high. So we, you know, we've been talking about how like this decrease is not going to be a linear, right? So and I don't think in this this next twelve to eighteen month path that we're going to have down to you know, hopefully what people expect to be 2% inflation, it's not going to be linear, right? It's going to have these jumps, ups and downs. And so I think one question I've been thinking about is what happens to the market when we have a month where inflation either stays flat or potentially spikes up for a month? You know, is the market going to freak out? Um, Is the Fed going to freak out? And what happens? So I think I like your bull case, you know, your, your starter of that bull case, but I think that's almost guaranteed to happen. This is not going to like decrease linearly and you have to expect that pop up. And then all of a sudden the question goes, and we talked about this in previous episodes. The The original question was, when is inflation peaked? And then now we're going to be like, well, when is it actually going to get down to 2%? Because it may not for a long time. Um, Dude, I think you nailed it. I think you nailed it because Steven is more of a trader than uh, 
any of uh, the other co-hosts. So like he's looking at a shorter term time horizon. And I think like in the near term, I think uh, we have gotten a little offside to the, to the hedge side or the short side, but like, you know, over a 12 month period, I'm, I'm like positive that we're still in a bearish environment. So I think Steven's right. Like, and, and I'm looking at the same thing, like in client accounts, like where do I, where do I just buy back in for like the, the midterm pump, you know, as like liquidity gets uh, eased a little bit, whatever they can do, we can probably get into that a little deeper. But um, I'm thinking like Stephen mentioned the earnings. Stephen mentioned uh, uh, here's another thing, like supply chain disruption. This is this is part of Darius's thing. Supply chain disruption using the ISM manufacturing data. Mm-hmm. He said supply chain disruption uh, has like sort of come back down to normalized levels quite a bit. So, um, you know, inflation could be coming back down and directionally that's bullish, obviously, but if it, if it just lingers in the four or five range for a long time, then obviously that's not bullish on a 12 month time horizon, but in the near term, that would signify a a bullish move. So I agree with you. I do. I do think the the easiest parts of the inflation going down have already, we we were capturing those now, like, right. uh, Releasing the SPR to decrease gasoline prices. That was certainly a a big decrease in, in July's number. And then, you know, I can, I can tell you, Eric, like just from firsthand, like um, I can tell that supply chains are easing up, like container costs have gone way down, haven't had any delays. Uh, production delays have been minor if, unless your factory is in like a zero COVID, you know, area. But other than that, like supply chain has been, been, fr- you know, pretty, pretty f- freely open, which is good. So I do think that. So let me ask, let me ask a question back to Steven then. Like if, if we do see these little bullish catalysts come through in, in the very immediate term, like, are you, are you thinking of that as sort of bear market over or are you just thinking to play that as a short-term pump just to be clear no I, i'm not thinking bear market over and like to be clear like, like a lot of these things work through on different time horizons right like these rate hikes they they take a long time to work through the economy um and i, I think one of the big catalysts that could actually send us lower is actually some sort of breakdown in in the consumer right something that actually does break down earnings you know but but like i feel like the markets to a large degree are are, are able to digest these hikes eventually once they sort of stabilize and there's like a little bit of uh, predictability to them um I do think there's like an extremely high probability that we enter into a deflationary quarter or two, uh, either early next year or Q2 of next year. Um, so yeah, I would be looking, I, I mean, I wasn't planning on like buying in July and then holding forever, but I thought there was like a really, really good opportunity to do a two X or a three X over the next, you know, three or four or five months, which is a pretty darn good return. Um, so the plan is to probably pretty aggressively um, take profits in October, November. Um, it's tricky. Like <laughs> the seasonality on crypto is pretty wild. Like September is always a terrible month, and in October is like I think the average return for Bitcoin in October is something absurd, like forty eight percent or forty <laughs> percent, and it's like almost zero in in September. And, and we were going to do a whole episode on uh, like the market in the midterms, what, what's the past data on midterms and mm-hmm. uh, on stock prices. And we, we're not going to do go, go too deep into the data, but short to say is that, you know, markets are usually muted going into the midterms and then they typically do very well after the midterms. So your maybe late October pump could, could definitely happen maybe right after midterms. And then that's that's a uh, regardless of party, by the way. Yeah, I mean, my my my, I think I outlined my my base case. I go, I don't know if I can't remember if it was last week or the week before, um, but it was it was before it was before Fed, right? Like my my base case was that we get nuked by the Fed and Jackson, and you know, I forgot the hedge, but um, the base case was we get nuked in Jackson. I, I I buy the dip. We didn't dip low enough for me to buy, so I didn't do that either. Well played, um, but uh, we would we would end up like going way up. After that, because I I thought that the combination of PCE missing by quite a bit, CPI down, um, and you know the incentives as I, as I saw them to sort of 
do particular things going into the election, um, plus the post-election pump, which we see a lot. I think that's like probably the biggest thing you can bet on. Like markets kind of just like certainty, I think, and they like not having open questions anymore is how you could interpret it. But all that to me, like just made a, a good risk reward. And that still is the current plan. If anything, that plan's gotten better because as we've looked at some of the data um, and from, from 42 macro, like they've, we saw they've like, dramatically hiked up the probability of like soft landing like we're in a case now where like the bull case the bear case and the the sideways case i think are like relatively equal probabilities in fact i would say like the bear case is like the lower probability i would say you have a slightly higher sort of neutral case a a, a moderate like goldilocks case and then the bear case is like the you know infl- continued inflation is is kind of low and that's like really the opposite of what sentiment is on Twitter with everybody. Everybody thinks that the world is ending and they can see it and nobody else knows this. And somehow this is going to be the first time the world actually nukes while everybody is talking about how the world's going to nuke. Man, and Eric I, looks I like, like he wants I, to say I something. I just want to always ask, like, <laughs> what's your time horizon? Because I, I feel like between even the three of us, we're, we're not always talking about the same time horizon. No, that's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Well, he's talking about and next three months, essentially. The next three months. And like where I'm thinking is like, uh, liquidity is going to be leaving over a longer term time horizon. You want to talk about net liquidity for a bit? Net liquidity is going to be is going to be exiting on from the balance sheet. That lever is going to be uh, pulling liquidity from the market. Um, why? Why do you think I, that? Just curious. Uh, well, that's what they've guided to. I'm, I'm taking it their word for their guidance on the balance sheet side. Um, uh, what was the the, the treasury? Uh, General Treasury account. general account, I think Janet Yellen has sort of guided to. So then that leaves only one left, the reserve repo or, or the reverse repo. And the reverse repo, I think, is like like Darius said, it's like it's too compelling of an offer to to wind down. Like nobody's gonna uh choose the alternative, which would be like short-term bills when the reverse repo is paying them higher. So. Right. So we, we, we talked about this in the, in the text thread before this, but essentially right now the uh, three-month T-bills um, are not providing as good of a yield if you look at what uh, the reverse repo facility will provide in three months. So when you make the duration three months equal to the reverse repo overnight rate, uh, the, there's like a half a percent difference and the reverse repo facility is risk-free. So, you know, what the thesis is that as long as there's, you know, uh, less return in T-bills, then you're not gonna pull that money out of money market accounts and and put it there or put it elsewhere in the market. But there could be a scenario where maybe we get some good economy numbers, like more numbers come in, and we see just people who have that money parked in money market accounts say, I want to go lend it out to people. I want to go invest it, or I'm okay investing in longer term time horizons. Right. Banks might want to take longer duration bets, but I think it's it's the exact same logic you would use to uh, be a bull on the merge. You would say like, oh, well, this can decrease selling pressure by X dollars over this time horizon. Well, like, so is the the balance sheet liquidity leaving. It's like, it's going to decrease liquidity by this amount of dollars over this time horizon. It's like, it's the exact same logic. So for me, I'm looking at those two things and I'm saying like, well, risk assets are going to go lower. Yeah. Um, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's different logic because the, the merge is programmatically a drip. It's a long duration, consistently predictive drip. The net liquidity equation, which as you guys said, is sort of fed balance sheet minus reverse repo minus uh, treasury general, um, is being held up right now by this sort of discrepancy in the 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 um, you know short duration treasury. There's a shortage in short duration tre- treasuries. It's pushing the rate lower, so people are like, as you said, like, why don't I just take the higher rate uh, with the overnight? That's that's less risk. But the second the market has like a preference for duration, all of a sudden. Like that demand doesn't necessarily have to change in a drip. Like there's trillions of dollars that in overnight could just decide they want longer duration. They want to take on more risk. And then that number could change like super um, dramatically. And it's kind of wild that this is what we have to talk about. But this is this is sort of what the market is like. I, I think rates are just a complete facade 
to be honest. Like, I think this is the thing. Well, I think it's good from a matters. micro perspective. Like if you're trying to, uh, you know, forecast a business's, you know, future cash flows, it's really important. It's, I think it's, it's the most, it's way more important. But if we're talking about general markets and asset prices, the, the amount but, of money. But, is but to play devil's advocate to that or push back on it a little bit, like, uh, y- y- your cash flows in terms of like how they manifest in like an earnings multiple, most earnings multiples are priced, uh, they're priced out longer on the curve, right? Like either like a 10 year or 30 year, depending on the, the, the particular security and, and the Fed exerts very little influence over the longer duration. I I, I would argue, um, you know, feel free to to disagree. But like I yeah, I see a lot of uh, I see a lot of kabuki theater um, <laughs> when I look at stuff and, and and to zoom way more out. I see trillions and trillions of dollars in liquidity and cash just sitting there on the sidelines, be it in checking uh, consumer checking accounts or corporate accounts. Um, or in these like money markets. And I see a world where we are clearly going down the path of like printing and stimulus. And it like, if you, if you don't see that, I think you're, you're, you're blind to it. Right. So I'm, I, I see just like this dam with a bunch of water on it. That's like, has a bunch of cracks in it. And I, I, I realize it's a little dangerous to kind of get out in front and try to catch that knife because yeah, I, I, I could get run over very, very badly. Yeah, but I think for for home gamers, I think the the way we've been tracking it is you can look at the Fed balance sheet and look at the change. You can obviously look at their notes saying they're going to double that decrease. You can look at the U.S. general account balance on on the Treasury website. And then you can uh, look at the reverse repo facility balance and and watch the change day to day. Um, You can also look at the the spread between short term duration T-bills and what the overnight, what is it, overnight uh, three-month swap, right, for the uh, reverse repo facility. So, so Nick, I got a question for you then. Yeah. Like, if we do believe that they're going to try to pump this market into midterm elections, like, and, and if we've already agreed that the Treasury General account is sort of where it's at, um, how and, and the balance sheet has been sort of uh, guided to how they're going to wind that down, like, how do you imagine they're going to increase liquidity leading into november when when like if if that is our thesis like yeah. how do you, how do you imagine that playing I mean, out I'm, because the the <laughs> levers don't work i i'm not on this uh tin foil like I, I mean i know you know uh janet yellen and uh their colleagues uh with uh fed you know chair powell like they you know she was in his position you know just a few years ago so I, they obviously do talk but i i don't necessarily see them um changing anything in the reverse repo facility to, to, to drain that. I, I think the Fed is going to still have tough talk, but I think where you're going to see it is on the fiscal side, right? Like we already saw it with um, student loan uh, forgiveness. There's some uh, fiscal relief going on, but I also think they kind of have the ammo they need. I mean, they've decreased um, you know, gasoline prices by uh, emptying out the SPR, and then they got a few bills passed, the inflation Reduction Act, I believe, um, was the most recent one. And so they now have some things to to go off of. And luckily, they have a job market that's still pretty pretty healthy. You know, we, it's obviously declining, but like compared to pre-COVID levels, it's in a very healthy place. So you got jobs. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and quite frankly, they, you know, the Democrats did not enshrine Roe v. Wade into law via legislative action. And so now there's this battle, I think they have something to rally the troops for to fight against, um, to try to, you know, codify, legalize abortion into law. So I think they have what they need um, to go strong into the to the midterm. So I don't know if they're going to, you know, necessarily pump liquidity in the next eight weeks, eight to 10 weeks. Maybe they don't so have to. I, I, I like what you mentioned there with the labor market because we focus so much on inflation and stuff. It's like, but I think the labor market is is uh, an area where they feel like they have runway to be like, okay, well, we can just really tighten beyond expectations because like the labor market is so strong. Uh, a couple things that I wanted to to point out, like this is just is just me coming at you guys. It's not uh, it's not like what I'm reading from Darius or whatever, but it's like <clears throat> I think. I, I've learned to not fight the Fed, and and the Fed seems to be tightening right now. Um, you know, like we can argue on their other levers, but it it just seems to me like the Fed's tightening, and they want to bring everything sort of down. So I, I don't want to fight the Fed. And then um, when I, when it comes to longer term buying, like I I know Stephen's like thinking of like 
the three month move, but like when I'm thinking of like the long term move where we actually pivot to like a bull market again, like what I would look to see is signs of true capitulation where everyone has like lost hope and faith and and we're not there. You know, like I want to see the pendulum shift so far to the other direction. Like I feel like, you know, we went bull market and now we're like, we're obviously in a bear market and like the pendulum has swung the other way. I want to see this pendulum swing way far the other way, like too far the other way where it's like, oh, well now I'm going to buy. Right. I, and I kind of take some of Stephen's points and I kind of turn them on their head a little bit, or at least I, I think of them from a different angle. So you mentioned that the consumer is healthy and, you know, jobs are healthy too. So when I look at that, I don't think soft landing. I think the Fed has the room they need to to tighten things up the way they, they want to. And I do think they're going to overcorrect because it is such a, a, a lagging indicator. And because, you know, interest rates take a long time to affect the market, I do think we're going to eventually see corporate earnings decrease. And the E out of the PE ratio um, will will go down. And I do think we'll see lower lows in, in the market. I do think we're still in this longer run liquidity down cycle. And I don't think the Fed sees anything that, that worries them at this point to, to pivot. And they seem all pretty unified. I mean, I, I don't know if you guys remember, but like before COVID, you know, there wasn't these like unanimous votes on interest rates between Fed governors. There was obviously like dissenting opinions when you would read the notes. And now we have fully unanimous, for the most part, votes. And we have a unanimous voice. They're coming out, you know, kind of like with planned notes and they're all on the same page. So I think it's pretty clear what direction we could be going on in, um, you know, in the liquidity yeah, longer cycle. Term, longer I, longer I, term. I think we're echoing each other, but, and, and I'll go one step further. It's like, you mentioned the E and the PE, like the numerator is going to go fucking down too. like the multiple is going to get fucking whacked when, when, this thing really and, capitulates. And it's I, gonna, it's gonna, it's both gonna go. And I think we kind of agree with Stephen. I think, I think short term we could most definitely see a pump post merge, a pump post, uh, post midterm elections. But then the data will start to come to roost. Like earnings will will decrease, liquidity will still continue to go down. The the economy. Not, we're not even talking about the global economy. Will will start to deteriorate. And uh, I think, you know, on the ETH side, you could have people who bought into the trade being like poking ETH, be like, this thing's not doing anything. I thought this was supposed to make number go up, but we we know it's this long-term compounding thing. It's not, you know, going to go to 10K in the first can, week. Can, can, can I push back on this Please. don't fight the Fed Your idea? Because people say this all the time and it kind of bothers me. Do you know how much money your Ethereum portfolio would have lost if you waited until the Fed started hiking to sell? Tell me. You'd be down like 60%. From the peak is what you're saying? Yeah. Like there is a point, and the the same is true of like the, the COVID crash. Like you would have been much richer if you anticipated getting out of the markets before it happened, right? Like there, there is a large benefit to getting ahead of the ball if you can, right? I think people sometimes over glorify how easy it is to hop on these pivots and get on board, right? And their, their memory is short because we went through what was like one of the easiest and longest sort of momentum bowl eras in history. But there's no guarantee that the future is going to look anything like that, right? And if you believe that inflation is going to be super volatile, for example, you're not going to have like 12 month stretches where you can just like wait to just buy and just like ride the market up. It's just not going to happen. Well, I mean, uh, my retort to yours is, you know, we've talked about we're not going to follow interest rates. We're going to follow net liquidity. And if you would have been following net liquidity in November, December, you would have started to see the reverse repo facility. I mean, even throughout whole 2021 really start to crank up and you would have saw net liquidity start I, to go down. I am skeptical that net liquidity can be used as a leading indicator. It can't. From it's, what it's I'm very seeing, difficult to be predicted. The market is sort of, like, from what I'm seeing, crypto is front running. Like when I look at the net liquidity chart, I see Bitcoin pumping like crazy before net liquidity went up. I see the Bitcoin crash happening before net liquidity go down, goes down last summer. Same thing happens on the on the upswing and on the downswing, right? So I, I wish it was as easy as that. And I and I think that it's a worthwhile thing to look at to sanity check yourself. Like it was interesting, for example, to to look at the the S and P relative to net liquidity like a couple of weeks ago, right? And you could see like oh. The S&P is way ahead of liquidity right now. It's anticipating liquidity is going to go up. 
I don't agree with that, so I can fade this, right? So it, I think it can be useful there, especially in TradFi markets, but I worry that crypto is too good at front running um, some of this stuff. So I, I think I prefer to take a step back from the data and like, like, like you, you notice a lot of the stuff I'm telling you is like, I'm game theorizing like how humans are going to react in particular situations. You're playing the player versus right? player mode. Yeah, and I'm just trying to anticipate like what, what will happen as opposed to like this is the data. Like, because I feel like sometimes there's some data where you look at it and you're just always going to be like a month behind or two months behind. Like if that's all you're looking at. So I I, I think it's a balancing act. I don't want to write it off like um like too much, but I I I do you know I. I keep it at arm's length right and I, I i also am just sort of really skeptical that it's a given that the world is going to go to hell in a handbasket over the next year um i'm not that old but i'm old enough to have been through a lot of the world is ending moments and the world never really did end and when it did end it was in two occasions i could remember where nobody saw it coming and it just happened out of nowhere i can think right? of two what are your two I mean, the GFC and COVID, right? Those were massive crashes. And I was going to put like 9-11 also in there. That was, yeah, another one. But yeah. that was sort of like a V recovery, right? Because right. it was it wasn't really necessarily systemic in the financial system. But yeah, so like I, I, I am skeptical that everybody knows what's going to happen. We are going to all be in a disaster and you shouldn't buy anything because everything's going lower. I think like um, a good strategy if you're in Eric's shoes, like if you do have like a long time horizon, well, you could always just buy now and just just like hedge, like if things start looking ugly, yeah, buy some puts or something like that. I don't know how advanced people are out there, but I, I like that strategy. I like that strategy, especially with crypto. You just buy when like that's a damn low price and I'm going to execute some hedges when stuff starts looking a little sketch. Can we uh, talk about, oh, go ahead, Eric. Uh, I, I just, I had questions for Stephen and you kind of answered them for me, but like they were all, they were all based on this idea of like, um, like timing of course is everything and, and and there's no way to do it properly. Right. Like, so, so if you're going to like, of course you don't fight the fed cause you want to front run the fed, but then like I would have tried to front run the fed in like 2018 and then like also again in 2019. And it's like, it's just, it's so hard to do because like, there's no, there's no really right answer either way you do it. You know, you're either following the data or you're trying to front run the data. And it's like, I, you know, for the last 10 years, I was saying like, oh, well, shit's overvalued, uh, crash is coming. And like, you know, it's like a boy who cried wolf situation, you know, like, and ultimately you're right, you know, and Jeremy Grantham is like, ultimately going to be right. He's like, yeah, well, we're in for pain. And he's like, yeah, well, sure enough. Yeah, after 11 years later, we're in for pain. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the way I look at that as like a more of a longer term investor is if over the course of my investing career, I would have got within 25, 30% of the bottom and sold within 25, 30% of the top, specifically when we're talking about crypto with so much volatility, like life's not so bad in that, in that scenario. So even if you are a little, uh, you know, late, if, if you have the right indicators that you believe in, uh, that you have high conviction in, you know, it, it is obviously, it's impossible to predict everything, but they're still useful. And I don't think or, you necessarily or, have to early. I mean, I mean, ETH, ETH, ETH hit like the 300 week, right? It's a, like if you're a believer in this thing at, at all and you believe in the asymmetry of it, I just kind of have to like buy that number, you know? And if it goes lower, then you 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 squeeze your butt and you just buy more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's like, uh, uh, these are like the moments you always look back Advanced trading tips on. from Steven Cesaro. <laughs> you always look back well, that, that's, like, why I, that's why I like the options trading stuff because it, it's at least enhanced against spot buying. You know, like I, I think I can... I don't need to time it perfectly as long as I can improve slightly against just I'll buy here, you know, right. like, and, and that's, that's where I'm kind of landed. Can, can we talk a little bit about ETH price specifically? And maybe we can kind of roughly end up there. Um, so I've been following, like I, I mentioned in one of our previous episodes, I follow the uh, 20 week moving average. I follow the 200 week moving average, kind of put those on, on the chart along with the, the volume profile. Um, and one thing I've kind of, picked up from Benjamin Cohen. I think he gets uh, most things right. Um, uh, you know, he has shown that like for Bitcoin and ETH, the 20 week moving average is a good sign if we're in a bull market or bear market. So we're currently below the 20 week, but um, we butt up against it uh, a, a few a little while ago and we dropped right back down uh, after it. And we're currently butting up against it now. And so my question to you guys is, 
um, is it a higher risk return to see if ETH goes above the 20-week moving average, drops down to it, retests it, and bounces off it? Is at that point at a higher risk return? You're obviously buying at a higher price, but is the risk much lower if it bounces off the 20-week um, and you know to the upside to, is what you're saying. ideally yeah. to the upside is what you're what you're predicting that you have higher conviction that it would bump to the upside um, versus here where um, you know we're we're not too far off the 20 week moving average maybe I don't know five ten percent I don't know the exact number um, it could you know barely peak above it and drop right back down so I don't know do you guys have thoughts on which is the better play there I mean Stephen you are you're playing with you're voting with your money but you know, Eric do you have any thoughts on that. No, I think it's a, I, like cuz cuz I'm not so much of a trader and I, I have I'm already on record saying I don't like look at the charts so much. So like I think it's a great question cuz for me like let's say we're in a, a long accumulation phase, right? Where we're sort of like down sideways, mostly sideways but slightly down. It's like at some point you do have to buy. At some point you do. And like and I don't I don't have that sort of like trigger price point inside me that says like at this target price i'm gonna go all in you know like but but i do have um, a fundamental view on something like eth we could use bitcoin as well and like what i what i'll say is that like if if bitcoin's at 19k right now or if he's at 1600 like and i'm gonna sell puts at it at a thousand i'm gonna sell eth puts at a thousand i'm gonna sell bitcoin puts at 13k like Am I okay buying there, like on a steep discount to where we're already discounted? Thirteen hundred, you mean? That that to me is my way of of sort of like DCAing in, collecting premiums along the way. If it's a long accumulation period, maybe we hit it a time or two, and I it gets put to me, and now I own the now I own the physical. It's like I'm good with that. Like I just I don't I don't know. Like that's it's not my style to know that like over a long period of time, like this is the the time to buy. Uh, like if you want me to talk specifically about the 20 week, um, I think it can be useful for like mean reversion plays. Like if you are maybe taking profit or getting an entry that you're waiting on or like adding to a position, I don't really think like, I don't base a lot of trading around it because I I think over shorter duration, there are like way better ways to get entries. Like I, I just like look like to look at, price right and over longer time horizons i think like the the 200 week and 300 week these kind of long duration things can be a useful thing for you if you aren't like super investment savvy it does give you a useful barometer to to see like is this high or low price like um but yeah like i don't i don't i don't consider it a lot i know we rejected off of it and dumped down or we went above it, it it's like it, it 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 looks like really obvious in hindsight when you look at the chart but in in, in the moment it's always very difficult to make any pr- predictions on that and like with, with eth specifically right like we were talking about like eric was talking earlier about like i want to see capitulation right like i look at the eth chart and beginning of the year we had thirty five hundred dollar eth 3578 we then proceeded to have 12 consecutive red candles in a row, followed by an absolutely ridiculous like candle where we went from 1428 to like sub nine in one week with the highest volume spike since like the absolute nuke last summer with three arrows and just Celsius just and 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 we we tapped off the 300 week and I just like look at all that and I'm like, OK, if I'm not going to buy here, like where like where are you going to buy? Yeah, I mean, we all did buy there. Yeah, yeah, but if you have more cash sitting around now, I think that's that's the question. Well, well, we have more cash sitting around now. Like, here's the problem: a lot of people see that and they're like, "Okay, well, I missed it. I'm gonna wait for a pullback." And then we go to 2K, and then we pull back to like 15 in the 14s, like 30 percent plus pullback. And people are like, "Oh God, I don't know. It's like it's <laughs> gonna go to zero again. That was the that was that that wasn't the real bottom." And then they don't buy again. Like right. you you have to kind of like make your plan. And then stick to it in the moment because you're always going to like your your brain is always going to make you do the wrong thing in the moment. Even if your plan was good three weeks ago, then like in the moment, you're like, oh, God, you look at the chart, you get the numbers just going down. It's like that Wojak meme where the candles just going down. And you're yeah, it's freaking I, out. And you don't you don't make a good decision. I do think if you had like price targets of like below 900 and you kind of are following like liquidity in the market as a way to like, you know, figure out when is a good time to buy. I think you do have to adjust them for what we've seen in the ETH BTC ratio. 
and that we've seen ETH take just a larger percentage of the total crypto market cap. So I think you do have to adjust your your price there a little higher because ETH is taking up more market share of, of crypto liquidity. Yeah, and uh, look, I, I think the ETH BTC ratio is is pretty bullish for crypto because it, it it tells me that like the entire market right now isn't just a risk on risk off BTC like derivative. It's thinking, right? It, it's like there are market participants thinking, hmm, there's some value here. There's some relative value here. There's something to be had here. Everybody's just not not putting on basically like a leveraged Bitcoin trade, which I think is great. And it shows like signs of life to me in the markets. Some people will say, oh, it's just PVP and money moving around and the last few participants duking it out. And maybe that is true, but it's certainly better than uh, the the alternative case. I, I'm curious, like, how are you guys positioned going into the merge? Like, are you just pretty kinda, heavy or are you? I mean, I, I, I never I still have my original bag. Like, I haven't sold any ETH from when I when I bought in I think in 2020. Oh, damn. So I still have that. So, um, Props. And, and I bought some around 900 and I had some additional cash. So I have that in the sidelines, um, just, just sitting there. And, um, I do think post, you know, kind of midterms, I don't know if it's going to be like at the end of the year or beginning of next year, I do think there'd be a, a better time to buy. And if it's not, it's not like, you know, I kind of have a multi-asset portfolio. It's not the only thing. So if it does run away, you know, no big deal. I'll, I'll put it into something else like uh, another apartment complex or or something else or another real estate play. Um, but yeah, if, if it does afford the opportunity, uh, I like to do that. Also, you know, I run a few businesses and I need to keep cash around for those businesses. So I have to actually play the actual economy and make sure there's, there's buffer there. So, um, you know, I feel better. I feel nice having that that big cash kind of cushion right now. So like, I think I'm going to keep it there. If the opportunity presents, put it all to work pretty quickly. It's funny because I, I, I wanted to ask the exact same question to you guys, because what I, what I'm noticing is the exact same thing. It's like, uh, you know, we do see correlation with like NASDAQ and crypto and whatever, but it's like, you do see idiosyncrasies within those cohorts. So for me, the way I've been playing it, sort of the start time was like, I want to be long the assets I like and short the assets I don't like. And uh, I, I have a long bias. I've already described that, you know, I get, I'm net long in, in client accounts, but like I'm more short than I've ever been uh, in my life. Um, but it's also like how I'm doing that is what matters. It's like, I'm, I'm short shit tech stocks that lose money hand over fist that are still trading at 10 times plus sales. Uh, I'm short coins that look uh, similarly to that shit tech, you know, like with, with like really inflationary tokenomics with no, no accrual mechanism on, on the way out uh, while also longing ETH while also longing uh, companies that have cash flows. So uh, it, it's a bit more nuanced than just being like, I'm short, I'm short index. Like, so for me, like, you know, that's how I'm playing it. It, it, I feel like that's the way forward, but, um, you know, I, that was my question to you guys. Cause yeah, it, it like, I'll say this straight up. And this is something I said even six months ago, the, if you, if you look at the world in like a weighted probabilistic type of, uh, framework it's hard like it's still so hard like there there's no right way to do this like everything seems uh plausible um it's difficult um i'm just going short shit that sucks and long stuff that's good like i'm long eth i'm short shit tech and yeah. i'm short defi coins with no no accrual mechanism with no way out and that's been working for me for six months and that's going to continue working for me. I think that's the way I'm going to play it. Yeah. And I think like what we've kind of learned as we kind of review more macro data that's coming out is, is like what Steven said, like the, the bull and the bear case almost have equal, uh, weightings, probabilities, and you kind of just have to take the data as it comes. And I think most importantly, position yourself for both scenarios, like be prepared for both. Don't get caught off sides or unexpected. Um, don't be blind to either scenario and just kind of pay attention. 
And uh, like, like, here's another question, and this is interesting to me. Like, how do you guys uh, monitor your success during this bear market? Because I'm like uh, pretty flat. I'm pretty flat in 2022, um, and that to me is a success um, to me. But um, it's you know, I I wonder like am, well, you're crushing am the benchmark so. <laughs> because I'm not just like YOLO short everything. Like, am I am I just do I suck? Because like this was like the generational short opportunity of our lives, and you know I'm flat here, and like that's cool. Or like how? Well, do you you're guys not feel you're not that? Stanley Druckenmiller reincarnated. So if that's your benchmark, you do suck. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean you're you're ahead of the benchmark. Yeah, I mean. I kind of, I guess I'm the most druck because I just put one trade on and YOLO it with like most of my net worth and just watch it obsessively all day. Fuck her up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I, I feel great. I feel pretty good about this year. I, I, I feel great about this year from an investing time horizon. I, I lost like seven figures and stupid hacks and stuff in DeFi. So that was unfortunate. <laughs> I'd be like way up if it weren't for that. Um, so I, I hate myself for that, but like I can like kind of hang my hat on trading, trading good. Um, so that's, that's nice for the, the future, I, I, I guess, because I, I expect that skill to compound in the future and I'll, I'll, I'll get the money back. Um, I wanted to ask you guys before I, before I forget, um, are, are you both in the sell the news camp? For Lemurge? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like a week after, roughly, I don't know, plus or minus. And, and the way that's manifesting itself in my portfolio is I'm selling calls. Like, I, I'm not going to sell actual spot ETH. Like, I'm going to hold ETH. Like, I, I don't want to, like, take a taxable gain on my long-term holdings or whatever. I'm just going to sell calls. And, like, if I if I get exercised, good. If you know, whatever, that, that's how I'm playing it. But I am a sell the news or for mm. sure. I think if my broader macro thesis plays out, I think you could get a scenario where it, we dump post merge and all the sell the news or proclaim victory. And then we just like absolutely rip in like mid October, late November. And then Hoffman declares victory. <laughs> and then Hoffman gets annihilated in December, January. And then everybody's sad. And then, but, then, like, <laughs> but everyone eventually wins in 20, 2024. Like, well, I think anybody who has the ball so just hold on for uh, actual movements. I'm talking like, you know, pump 2K, dump down to 13, 12, and then rip to like 3K plus by end of year type thing. If we rip to 3K plus by the end of the year, I'm going to be You will have lost a uh, lot of uh, I'll be very happy a lot, a lot of money the on the, the covered calls table, I guess. <laughs> but uh, you'll be pretty USD rich, so you'll be able to sleep well at night, I guess. Yeah, it's almost like my plan was working to perfection, if that if that works, and, and, unless it goes to 10K. Yeah. <laughs> How are we doing on time here? Are we supposed think, to be wrapping this? It is. It is that time. Okay. The music. I guess so. So so basic takeaways. I, I think if you're if you think that inflation is going to miss a lot, you're a believer in asymmetry. You like to fade sentiment, and you think the Fed is is talking a little. A little, little tough, and you believe in uh, politicians doing things to you know. Then I, I think you can make a good argument for being a uh, bull here. And if you don't believe any of those things, and you, you think that uh, liquidity is going to keep draining, there's there's no reason to be in the markets. Yeah, and I think if if you think inflation is going to be choppy on the way down, and that's going to spook markets, and we're in this longer term liquidity down drain, then and you're a longer term <coughs> trader, you know, I think cash is okay here. Um, so. Eric, were you uh, any other options that we missed between those no, two? I think you guys nailed it. I, I forgot one little data point that I wanted to mention is that a, a sentiment trader told me that uh, we were three times more uh, institutional put buying this week than 2008 and 2001. Oh, I love like to hear huge that. Huge put. That's buying. bullish. I love to hear that. That's okay, bullish. So I think that's like a feather in Stevens' cap. Yes. But, uh, I, I agree with both of you. I, I think. I think that's it. Let's all agree that nobody knows what's going to happen. And the biggest thing is to keep in mind the, the long-term thesis and, and, and manage your, your worst case scenarios and, and survive. And still I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure that like even $1,600 ETH is like still undervalued for where I see this asset going. In the long uh, run, long I, I agree basis. with you. I, I, I fear in the bad scenario that we underestimate how long the long run is and how painful the volatility <laughs> yeah. will be along the way. Could I'm be hoping a good topic that's for the next not the case, but... 
look back at an Amazon.com chart sometime and think about what that might feel like and you know, that well, can kind of check your bullishness. Let's just all make sure we're rich in 2024, 2025. Yeah, we're that trying. Is. Yeah, all right. All right, guys. I think that's a good place to wrap it. Good job. Miss you, Armand. Good job, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye. Later. Adios.